morning. Thank you so much. Good morning. Thank you so much for being here, Krishna Pandey ji, for taking the time, and Ravi for hosting it. Thank you all. Good. We'll start with the school prayer. Uh, Ravi, yeah. will you will you take I it ask. on? Please. Thank uh, you. No, Ram is next next to me. I'll call him. Ah, okay. Yeah. Lovely. Lovely. Mm -hmm. May we request Ram to say the school prayer? Yeah. Thank you. The hidden, the, the, the hidden life. Mm -hmm. Oh, hidden life. Vibrant in every atom. O oh, hidden light, shining in every creature. O oh, hidden love, embracing all in oneness. He each who feels himself as one with thee, know he is also one with every other. Thank you so much, Ram. Lovely to see you. Thank you so much. Uh, Krishna Paniji, can we start? Uh, we, we have the uh, Gayatri Mantra. Yes, we can. Uh, Maliti. Thank you. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Yes. Om Bhur Bhubasvaha Tatsavitur Varenyam Bhargo Devasya Dimahi Dio Yona Prachodayat Om Bhur Bhubasvaha Tatsavitur Bargo Devasya Dimahi Dio Yona Prachodayat Om Bhur Bhuvasvaha Tatsavitur Varenyam Bargo Devasya Dimahi Dio Yona Prachodayat Om Shanti 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 Hi Asatoma Satgamaya Tamasoma Jyotirgamaya Mrityoma Amritangamaya Om Shanti 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 Thank you so much, Malti. Well, thank you. Yeah. Krishna Paniji. Yeah. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all the other participants may kindly mute themselves. Yeah. Thank you so much. We will uh, take up the. Yeah. Those who are joining may kindly mute themselves. Amina Nirulaji, kindly mute your uh, speaker. Thank you. Thank you. We will uh, start with the uh, second uh, verse. Um, yeah. Uh, are you able to see the screen? Oh, Adjust the screen, yeah. sir. Yeah, the, this is okay? Yeah, okay, sir. Okay. Little more down, sir. I'll, I'll, I'll move it. I'll move it. No, but this is the I'm, I'm focusing only on the second one. Okay. The second verse. Okay. 
Yeah. Now, last time we have seen that uh, the first verse is very clearly told us for whom this is being composed and for whom this particular text will be really beneficial. That means those who have purified themselves by austerities and are peaceful in heart and calm and who are free from cravings and are ardently desirous of liberation. Okay. These are the, this is what was uh, the, 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 the meaning of the first words. And there, very clearly we have seen what is tapas and uh, with reference to Bhagavad Gita, what actually constitutes tapas of the body, tapas of the speech and tapas of the mind. Whereby one is greatly attenuated and uh, who has attenuated uh, all his uh, evil tendencies to a great extent, who is peaceful without cravings and has an ardent desire for liberation. Mumukshutva. This Mumukshutva has got two dimensions. If you have, if you remember what we discussed, there are two dimensions. Right? There is the, the urgency for transformation and the intensity required for transformation. So Mumukshutva actually is not a desire per se. You can't really classify it as a, any other desire. Here, it is more a case of urgency and intensity. Both are required and then only it is called as Mumukshutva. And very interestingly, for those who have read the small book called that The Feet of the Master, in that the great masters have thought it fit to translate this idea of Mumukshutva as love. They have called it as the great universal love, which is the driving force for the entire creation and also the driving force to bring about that great transformation whereby one is truly liberated and free. So that's the idea. Now we come to the second verse. The second verse says, Bodhonya sadhane bhyohi sakshan mokshaika sadhanam pakasya vakni vadhyanam vina moksho na siddhyati. Just as the fire is the direct cause for cooking, so without knowledge, no emancipation can be had. Compared with all other forms of discipline, knowledge of the self is the one direct means for liberation this is the very uh, general translation of the verse we will see very particularly what it actually means anya sadhane bhyaha bodhaha sakshat mokshaika sadhanam which means when you compare it with all other sadhanas The sadhana related to awareness, awakening, or what is generally called as self-knowledge. This knowledge is not like ordinary knowledge. So compared to any other form of uh, forms of uh, disciplines, because generally from a traditional point of view, we talk about uh, uh, bhakti as a marga, karma as a marga. That means uh, devotion as a way or action as a way to liberation and all that. But here the author very category, categorically tells us that as compared to any other form of uh, sadhana, the one direct or the only sadhana that can truly liberate can be truly liberating is what is called as bodha. Bodha means awakening. Bodha 
though it is generally translated as knowledge or being aware of it or something like that, but the root meaning is awakening. Bodha. And from this Bodha only the term Buddha comes. The term Buddha is derived from Bodha. That means the one who is awakened. They also use the term Prabuddha. Prabuddha means one who is truly awakened. So, the awakening of self-realization or awake, bringing about that transformation through awakening as compared to any other form of uh, self-discipline, this is the best or this is the direct one. Sakshat. Sakshat, if you remember in some other context I have mentioned, it also means direct and immediate. Sakshat means right in front of our eyes. That means we are looking at it with open eyes. These eyes are not the physical eyes, but the spiritual vision they are talking about. So it is something which is direct and immediate, whereby a person is awakened. And without this awakening, there cannot be any true liberation. And a beautiful simile is given here. It says, Pakasya Vakhnivat. Pakasya Vakhnivat means, Paka means cooking. Vakhni means fire. Can there be any cooking without uh, fire? No. You can't cook anything unless there is fire. Fire in some form or the other. If in the modern days, you can talk about uh, microwave ovens or something like that where you don't really see the fire. But there is a fire in some form or the other. That means that which generates heat and light. Okay. So, just as a fire is the direct means required for cooking, so also self-knowledge or Atma Bodha is the only direct and immediate sadhana for awakening of intelligence or what we call as liberation. So, without, just as without fire you cannot have cooking done, similarly without bodha, moksha is not possible. That is the meaning of it. Now, let us see the uh, beauty of this simile. Paka also means ripening. Paka means ripening. Something which ripens. Comes to a state of ripening. And Vahni is a symbol of that intensity which we have been talking about. Fire is a sim symbol of intensity. And anything that comes into contact with that fire is burnt. So, Vahni also symbolizes tapas. And only tapas can lead to ripening. That is the deeper meaning of this term, Pakasya Vahnivat. Paka the ordinary meaning is cooking. There is a term called pakva. Pakva means ripened. Paripakva means ripened in all possible manner. Ripened on all sides. That means totally ripened is called as paripakva. That also comes from the same root called pach. Pach, the root word is to digest. And the secondary or derivative meaning of it is something which is cooked which is easy to digest. So that's how it comes as Paka and also the term Pakva and Paripakva. All of them are derived from the same root. So the ripening or becoming perfect can only happen 
with that intensity of the inner fire whereby anything and everything that is inessential is completely burnt out. Only the real thing that needs to be cooked properly is cooked. Everything else, the impurities or what is not required, all that is simply evaporated. Like mostly what happens with cooking, lot of this uh, water in it is evaporated and whereby the substance gets beautifully cooked. So this is a beautiful symbolism that is used here to represent the direct and immediate nature of fire and this fire being a symbolic representation of tapas which burns all things which are inessential and also it leads to it leads to ripening a person is paripakva a person becomes paripakva means one who has matured who has ripened to an extent whereby the fruit whatever ripens beautifully is uh, obviously very tasteful. So, bodha, the awakening, the coming to a state of self-knowledge, that means one understanding oneself in totality, is the means for direct and immediate liberation. This is the important uh, factor that is being brought out here because uh, as I said, I have deliberately given the title as Atma Bodha and intuitive appreciation. One has to intuitively appreciate the idea and the concept and the necessity of it, which implies these two things, direct and immediate direct and immediate because the mind has a tendency to postpone things the mind has a tendency to convert something which is experiential into a mere idea or a verbal statement that is the danger of the mind the mind converts something into an idea a concept an opinion a kind of uh, verbalization of it and thinking that it has understood. It remains in that state. So here, the role of the mind has to be substantially minimized and one has to delve deeper into that experiential state of being which brings about that urgency for a direct and immediate experience which is self-liberating. It is not something you desire for or you are asking for. The very awakening brings about transformation. It is not a, a, a kind of a sequential thing. It is not sequential. The very awakening is the transformative by nature. Like uh, a lamp. It is You can't distinguish uh, the two things as separate as though you bring a lamp and then that lamp uh, progressively removes darkness. No. The very lighting of the lamp is the dispelling of darkness. There are not two processes. And they, there is no element of time. One happening uh, first and the other happening next. No. They happen simultaneously. So this is the idea which has to be very deeply rooted in our intuitive faculty. And, you know, bring about that seriousness in us. The urgency and the immediacy of it for transformation. Here, the very subject which we are talking about is Atma Bodha. One has to bear this in mind very clearly. Atma Bodha is self-knowledge. 
and this knowledge is no ordinary knowledge. See, the difference between ordinary knowledge and what we term as a transformative knowledge or spiritual knowledge, these are only words again. Please hold on to the deeper meaning of it. From the worldly point of view, knowledge is something you acquire. For example, I study mathematics or physics or biology or political science or some other subject. I acquire knowledge there. From a mundane worldly point of view, it's an acquisition. It's an accretion or addition to what you are. That is from the worldly point of view. But from the spiritual perspective, knowledge is transformative. And in fact, it is transformative to the extent that you become that. Brahmavid Brahmaiva Bhavati. The knower of the Brahman becomes Brahman. Here you have to, you have to understand the subtlety of it. See, a knower of mathematics is, doesn't become mathematics. A knower of, uh, say, political science or history or some other subject doesn't become that subject. Isn't it? It's only an acquisition. It is something you add to yourself. But here, the reverse process. The process is you get rid of everything that is accrued to you as an individual, as that entity which we call as I. And uh, it is transformative to the extent that whatever knowledge you acquire of the self, you become that self. And that self, the Atman is absolutely no different in any manner, in any respect whatsoever from the Brahman. Except for the fact that the Atman is conditioned and subject to ignorance. Whereas the Brahman is totally unconditioned and has no frontiers, no limitations, no boundaries and is beyond ignorance in all respects. But essentially, qualitatively, the Atman and the Brahman are one and the same. So the moment you acquire the knowledge of Atman, it gets transformed into Brahman. This is the fundamental idea of Vedanta. Fundamental idea of Vedanta is that this particular knowledge Unfortunately, we are forced to use the term knowledge. Knowledge comes from the word to know. Know comes from the word jnana. That is why you have the English term called gnosis, which starts with a G. G-N-O-S-I-S, gnosis, is derived from the Indo-European language base of which Sanskrit is the basic uh, basis from Jna, Jnana. That is the reason why phonetically, though it is the G is not uh, pronounced, it is retained in spelling because this G is from the Jna, Jnana. That is how it comes. So this is the Gnosis. That means this is that knowledge which is self-transformative. It brings about a radical and total transformation in oneself whereby one is totally free of all limitations and the self recognizes the fact that it is no longer bound by any limitations and it is totally free. In fact, the, what we call as this I is actually an accretion on account of ignorance. So when the, once, that, once that ignorance is totally dispelled, the I also disappears along with it. Because I is a creation of the ignorance. We'll come to it progressively. But this, this fundamental aspect has to be very clearly borne in our mind. So that is the reason why at the very beginning he is emphasizing that 
self knowledge is the only means for emancipation there is no other means it is not a question of debate or argument or contesting and saying that also does this this also does this there are n number of ways and all that no it is not a way actually self awakening is not a way as it is understood with respect to other things suppose you have somebody is traveling from a to b there can be 10 different routes from a to b from a from a physical point of view but from a spiritual point of view there is only one way you you disappear at a and appear at b which is the quantum way of uh, uh, transformation there is a quantum leap and there is a direct uh, jump from a to b see from 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 a, a an ordinary uh, you know preparatory point of view one may talk about a path one may talk about a way or direction in which one is moving that's why very beautifully in the ancient uh, indian uh, scriptural uh, literature we find lots of beautiful examples one is called as a vihangama marga like the flight of an eagle or a bird it's direct and it doesn't leave any trail when a bird is flying it doesn't leave any trail that's the that's the beauty of it and it is direct it doesn't go criss cross here and there and then uh, uh, fly to its destination that's why we have the english saying uh, uh, straight as a crow flies which uh, mathematically between any two points uh, the shortest route is the straight line okay now there is another uh, beautiful simile that is given is that of uh, the movement of an ant that's called as a pipilika marga you have, so if you have seen an ant uh, if it is trying to cross from one end of the room to the other end it will not go diagonally from one end to the other end uh, which is the shortest route it will go along the borders along the sides of that uh, room from one end to the other end it will go because it always wants a support a protection it always is looking for a way whereby it is not uh, killed in the process if it's trying to cross across, go across the room there is always the possibility of some somebody stepping on it and then being in the process being killed but if you are going along the edges nobody would uh, you know we don't walk on the edges uh, and the ant is so small that it's not possible to walk along the edge and crush it so that's called as a pipilika marga all these kinds of ways and means are suggested only for a beginner for a as a preparatory thing only as preparatory but the the actual way if i may use the term is self awakening which is transformative instantaneously direct and immediate transfer you see in the very first verse he has put very strict conditions purified through austerities one who has already attained a high degree of uh, peace and calm in one's own heart and who is most of the cravings are not there in him and his only ardent desire again in quotes if i want if the if desire is the word that is normally used but it is more a case of urgency the he the person who has that urgency for change for such a person self awakening is the only means there are no other means it has to be understood in that context and that's why i said it's not a question of debate or argument or discussing one against the other which is better jnana or karma or bhakti or that or this or that it is irrelevant now 
all these things become irrelevant. When you have a something, some urgent requirement, you plunge into action and do the best possible action in that urgency. So that is what is self-awakening about. So in comparison with anything else, this is far, far, far superior and has no relationship to any other form of transformation. And transformation from a spiritual perspective cannot be progressive. Preparation can be progressive. Preparing to transform can be progressive. But the actual transformation cannot be progressive in any manner whatsoever. You may prepare yourself progressively. I may prepare myself. But when you are actually doing it like an, like a, an examination in the ordinary world, I may prepare for one year for the examination. But the actual examination is only three hours and at one shot. You can't spread out these three hours to one hour per month and then have three, three months time to do complete the examination. No, it is at one shot. But the amount of time you prepare, you take to prepare yourself for this purpose could be any amount. That's not that, that, that's of no consequence. Here now we are on the verge of jumping and diving into it. Therefore, the urgency for direct and immediate transformation. And the only way is through self awakening and as I said, Pākasya Vakhnivat is a beautiful term because Pāka represents maturity, refinement, ripening and being ready to drop off. A very ripened fruit, what happens to it? It will simply drop off from the tree. It no longer is held by the tree. The tree has no hold on it any longer. So that's the ripening of it. And what is it that brings that ripening? This inner energy, this inner fire, inner dimension, which is represented here by the fire. There's a burning, you know, something which is very, very much disturbing for us. That will, That is what will spur you to the right action. That is the meaning of this. Though the verse may appear to be very simple and the translation of it, if one simply reads it, yeah, okay, just as the fire is direct cause for cooking, so also knowledge is the only means for emancipation. And compared with anything else, this is the only means for liberation. The, 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 ver the uh, verbal meaning is not what is uh, important to us. What is important to us is to have an intuitive appreciation of the intent what is being conveyed is at the cost of repeating. I am emphasizing the fact it is something which has to be direct and immediate. And this is the only way. Nanya Pantha Ayanaya Vidyate is another Vedic mantra. Is that there is no other path to go. If we, if we borrow a term from Jiddu Krishnamurti, it is a pathless land. Truth is a pathless land. So that is the intuitive appreciation one needs to have when we are studying Atma Bodha. Repeatedly, I am going to emphasize on this and in every shloka, wherever possible, we come back to this idea because we need to, in a way, strengthen the functioning of our intuition rather than strengthening the functioning of the intellect. That part of it is taken care of in Tattva Bodha. That part of it is very clear in Tattva Bodha because that beautifully gives you a very schematic way of presentation as to the whole structure of Vedanta, how it operates and gives a in a preliminary manner, the definitions are all provided in Tattva Bodha. We have left that. That preparation is over. The second level, we are, we are going to the higher level of understanding, which is the intuitive level of understanding. Okay? I hope uh, I have made myself clear. And this will be the refrain. 
continuously i'll be coming back to this idea when we are discussing atma bodha this will be my refrain uh, or uh, from a uh, you know uh, music point of view what you call as the late motif the a, a, a recurring uh, tune uh, which which keeps uh, haunting uh, the listener that's what i am going to do we'll come to the third verse i hope uh, things are clear and there are no no i think better you see the chat box krishna okay sir okay yeah, yeah i am seeing the chat box sir hmm. sunita mir chandani ji as havan is a fire please explain the greater significance yes, of this practice see this is same thing see uh, performance of a, a ritual is prescribed in the vedas as a karma marga or karma as a way to attaining what one desires so a havan or a homa or a yagna is performed for a very specific reason there are some homas or some yagnas which are done for universal welfare also that's that's also there but generally from the point of view of veda the karma kanda prescribes performance of havan or homa or yagna okay but what we are talking is a ajnana yagna that is an ordinary yagna what we what we talk about as havan or homa what we are talking about is jnana yagna jnana itself is a yagna is a sacred ritual the very understanding or awakening is itself a sacred action or ritual which we are going about and that is the distinction between an ordinary worldly from a worldly point of view what a yagna is performed for and what is done from the uh spiritual point of view uh manjula devi said is negativity also gets but obviously see negative anything negative is a burden is something which pulls you down which pulls you down anything negative is something which pulls you down so it is inessential and it has to be burnt it has to be burnt completely okay so therefore it is important to understand the nature of negativity see even from a uh, physical point of view one can understand that energy which is negative is dense is heavier and it holds on to the person who is generating it therefore it is more damaging to the person who is generating that negative energy than against whom that negative energy is directed it does more damage to the person generating that negative energy then what one expects out of it if i if i think that i want something bad to happen to somebody it won't happen the law of nature does not permit that the law of nature from its uh, karmic angle will take care of everything you or are my wishing that something bad should happen to somebody cannot be operational from the natural law, law point of view so all that negative energy will cling to you or me who is the generator of that negative energy and unless that is completely destroyed and completely burnt out so that is the reason why the simple mantra of loka samasta sukhino bhavantu sarve santu niramaya sarve bhadrani pasyantu ma kashchit dukha bhag bhavet these mantras are given not for the heck of it just for saying that it is good and it is uh, it has a very deep meaning 
ಸ್ವಸ್ತಿ ಪ್ರಜಾಭ್ಯ ಪರಿಪಾಲಯಂತಾಂ ನ್ಯಾಯೇನ ಮಾರ್ಗೇಣ ಮಹೀ ಮಹೀಷಾ ಯು ಆರ್ ವಿಶಿಂಗ್ ದಟ್ ದಿ ರೂಲರ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಕಂಟ್ರಿ ರೂಲರ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಎ ಸ್ಟೇಟ್ ರೂಲರ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ನೇಷನ್ ಶುಡ್ ಬಿ ಬೆಸ್ಟೋರ್ಡ್ ವಿತ್ ಗ್ರೇಟ್ ವಿಸ್ಡಮ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಇಂಟೆಲಿಜೆನ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ದೇ ಶುಡ್ ಟ್ರೇಡ್ ದಿ ಪಾತ್ ಆಫ್ ರೈಟಿಯಸ್ನೆಸ್ ನ್ಯಾಯೇನ ಮಾರ್ಗೇಣ ಮಹೀ ಮಹೀಷಾ ಗೋ ಬ್ರಾಹ್ಮಣೇಭ್ಯ ಶುಭಂ ಬಹುತು ಆಲ್ ದಿ ಅರ್ತ್ ಗೋ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ದಿ ಅರ್ತ್ ಗೋ ಡಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಮೀನ್ ಎ ಕೌ ದೇರ್ ಆರ್ ಸೆವರಲ್ ಮೀನಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಫಾರ್ ದಿಸ್ ಟರ್ಮ್ ಗೋ ಗೋ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ಭೂಮಿ ಗೋ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ದಿ ಅರ್ತ್ ಬ್ರಾಹ್ಮಣ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ಎ ವೈಸ್ ಮ್ಯಾನ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಎ ಕಾಸ್ಟ್ ಆರ್ ಕಮ್ಯುನಿಟಿ ಸೊ ದಿ ಅರ್ತ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಆಲ್ ದಿ ವೈಸ್ ಮ್ಯಾನ್ ಆನ್ ದಿ ಅರ್ತ್ ಶುಡ್ ಬಿ ಪ್ರೊಟೆಕ್ಟೆಡ್ ಆಸ್ಪೀಷಿಯಸ್ ಥಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಶುಡ್ ಬಿ ಹ್ಯಾಪನಿಂಗ್ ಆನ್ ದಿಸ್ ಅರ್ತ್ and to all the wise men because uh, the world is uh, held up the whole world the creation is sustained through by wisdom so go brahmane bhya shubham bhavatu nityam loka samasta sukhino bhavantu this loka samasta sukhino bhavantu is the last uh, line of the four line uh, uh, verse the earlier lines are very clear swasti prajabhya paripalayantam let all the citizens all the people in this world be good and be and taken care of and may they be ruled over by rulers who are wise and who adhere to the path of righteousness nyayena margena thereby protecting all the earth the entire earth and the wise men on this earth that is the meaning of it the reason for this is this once once you um, generate such positive energy that also destroys the negativity you need not work on destroying negativity separately keep on generating good keep on generating positive energy which will overwhelm the negative energy and drive away the negative energy completely so that's how one gets over uh, the negative energy and uh, janaki ram ji has coined uh, this acronym uid eh? uh, beautifully urgent intense and direct uh, that's good uh, to remember and uh, ramchandran ji also keeps adding to uh, the acronyms uh, which i keep giving uh, during my you know various uh, disc- discourses discussions which we have i keep giving all this this is a good addition to it and uh, ramchandran ji says now i am getting what is quantum leap yeah that the idea is that uh, vijay lakshmi marg magal ji says and then how does shapa work you become an instrument for bringing about welfare see cursing somebody is not uh, possible for anybody actually there are two things truly blessing somebody or cursing somebody are not really possible for an ordinary person it is only for the saintly and the truly wise people they can truly bless a person and truly curse a person also and their curse is for eliminating one's bad karma and bringing about the welfare of the world that is the beauty of it so see we, we might have seen we may be cursing so many people uh, in so many ways but nothing really happens that fellow keeps on thriving and doing whatever he wants to do even though you may be cursing why because the your curse doesn't have that energy one is not capable enough to bring about that energy to curse somebody because this curse is not something which is purely negative a wise man's curse ordinarily is a great blessing for the world is a great blessing for the world there's a beautiful story uh, in the uh, prior to the ramayana prior to the birth of uh, shri rama it is parvati who curses uh, shri mahavishnu she curses vishnu 
I don't, I'll not go into the context of it. In one context, when Shiva's uh, consort wife goes to Vishnu and asks him to help her. Now he does some, uh, you know, actions whereby though it appears to be helping Parvati, it actually creates what is called as a separation between Shiva and Parvati. The Shiva and Shakti are made to appear as though they are temporarily separated. Then Parvati curses and says, may you be born as a human being and you shall be separated from your wife and then only you will know the pangs of separation. That is Parvati's curse. Now what happens? Vishnu, on account of that curse, he is forced to take the birth as of an avatar as Sri Rama and suffer the pangs of separation through the abduction of Sita by Ravana, whereby he goes and kills Ravana, which is for the welfare of the world. You see, the, the, the whole thing is very complicated. It is not very simple. Not, uh, see, cursing is not everybody's job. Neither is blessing. Neither is blessing. It doesn't happen that way unless you have the tremendous amount of positive energy. I can truly bless somebody and my blessing will become true only when I have the tremendous energy. And similarly, if I curse somebody also, it is not out of personal vengeance or uh, uh, some kind of hatred, but it is transformative. I, I want that person to be transformed. So he has to undergo a uh, test. You know, he has to pass through fire which is not only good for him, but good for the entire humanity. It is for the welfare of the humanity. So that is how these things work. And actually, there are a lot of, uh, you know, deeper meaning. And there are several examples of this uh, cursing of Shapa. There are several beautiful examples. The esoteric meaning of uh, if we go into that Shapa, which can itself be a two-day program uh, working on the the karmic, uh, this thing from a cosmic point of view. One simple example I have given you is the, the, the curse of Shiva, uh, Parvati, uh, asking him to take birth as a human being and be separated from his wife. What, what is the end result of it? End result of it is the killing of Ravana, who is a uh, Again, uh, 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 the, one of the greatest, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, dangers on this earth because he is creating havoc. And there is another beautiful this thing: why Ravana is born in the first place, how Sanat Kumara uh, curses the uh, two Dwarapalakas, two gatekeepers of uh, the Vaikuntha, where, where uh, uh, Vishnu resides, Jaya and Vijaya. There's a beautiful way for all these things. I, I, a lot of uh, it'll take a lot of time to explain these things. But please remember that Shapa works only in the case of those whose tongue always speaks the truth. Rushinam punarajyanam vachamartho nudhavati. There's a beautiful verse in the Uttararama Charita of uh, Bhavabhuti. He says, in the case of a Rishi, in the case of a great saint. Meaning runs after words, he says. They will simply utter words. Meaning runs after the words. They, they, they could be words which may not have any meaning, but they will acquire meaning because they have come from a Rishi. That is how the whole Ramayana also begins. When uh, uh, the, the beautiful verse of Valmiki, Manishada Pratishtham Tvamagama Shashwati Sama this is the one of the first utterances which comes out of the great sorrow when Valmiki sees a hunter killing the male bird. When, when there are two of these crouchers, crouchers are like swans or what you call as cranes. So of a beautiful couple of cranes, the hunter kills the male crane and the lady bird is weeping. And that brings out a great sorrow and he utters a curse and that becomes a verse. 
and that verse is the starting verse for the Ramayana. So you see the 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 the, the esoteric this thing we had in curse is uh, uh, you know uh, so vast uh, that it needs great uh, depth of understanding and uh, the esoteric meaning has to be you know unraveled. You have to unravel the esoteric meaning of these curses. Um, you see, uh, Vijay Lakshmi Magalji quite often uh, puts me into this kind of predicament where uh, uh, I need to <laughs> digress and go into other subjects, but we'll come to that later. Um, uh, prayer, Anchal Singalji, prayer also works the same way. The prayer, the intensity. It's again the same thing. Are you serious about it? And do you have that intensity? Or is it a casual desire you think that some God will come and uh, help you out and uh, make you uh, fulfill your wishes? No, it doesn't happen that easily. Prayer works, but it depends again on the intensity of it. And if, if it is more a case of a, a personal desire, it is left to the mechanism of karma to fructify. It's the mechanism of karma to fructify. So if, if I have a selfish desire and pray for it, then the scheme of karma will take care of it in such a manner that there is actually a saying which says, "May there is a curse which says, may all your wishes be fulfilled. If all our wishes are truly fulfilled, there is no bigger curse than that. Luckily, because our prayers are not so intense and our desires are also not so intense, they are not really fulfilled. But because the untrained mind has got such a, you know, muddy and complicated structure of desires in it, that if all that nonsense starts fructifying and gets fulfilled, then we'll be in great trouble. It'll be terrible, uh, this thing. So, so limitation is a great boon. Let us not wish for anything which we don't deserve. Let all our prayers be directed towards the welfare of the world because I am a part of the world. If the world around me is happy, I am happy about it. I can't say that I should be the only person to be happy in this world to the exclusion of everybody. Such prayers will not fructify. And even if they fructify, they put us into great karmic debt and we'll be stuck here. But prayer at its own level works provided there is purity and intensity. Quantum leap. leap. Yes, you can say that the quantum is immediate and direct and instantaneous. is pathless land. Pathless land in the sense you cannot actually trace it out that way. That I am moving in this from this direction to that direction. Awakening, when it happens, it happens effortlessly, and there is no cause and effect relationship between the two. In the Bhagavad Gita, Adi Shankara makes it very, very clear that there is absolutely no cause and effect relationship between jnana and moksha. All jnana, all what the sadhana which you are doing for awakening is for actually removal of ignorance only, is for removal of ajnana. Action can be done only for that. The other thing, what one calls as liberation or moksha, has no cause and effect relationship with anything. If, they, if that were to be in some form related through cause and effect to anything in manifestation, then it will not be infinite. So it is always, a, as I said, a quantum leap from one state of being to another state of being. And that is what we call as a totally transformative experience or what we call as liberation or freedom or whatever term one may use. Okay, they are only words. We do not really have the experience of that state of being. The whole struggle is to prepare ourselves adequately to take that quantum leap. That's what we are trying to do. Beyond that, uh, nothing else is required. We'll come to a point, a tipping point, whereby 
we 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 are transformed totally transformed and we take a quantum leap into the other dimension which is timeless beyond space and beyond causality space time and causality causation do not bind the brahman the infinite it is only in manifestation we find space time and causation working okay i think we have had enough discussion on this verse number 2 shall we proceed to the third verse i think the third verse is a simpler verse uh, which is a continuation of the same idea which is given here which uh, says avirodhitaya karma na vidyam vinivartayet vidya vidyam nihanyatyeva tejas timira sanghavat action cannot destroy ignorance karma avidyam na vinivartayet why is it that action cannot destroy ignorance because action itself is bound by ignorance avirodhitaya means action and ignorance are not in conflict with each other if you remember i have mentioned the sequence of ignorance desire and action it is ignorance once cre which creates the limitation which creates the sense of lack lacking something in us that sense is what drives us to desire in order to fulfill that inadequacy in us and that desire spurs us to do action so action essentially springs from desire and desire springs from ignorance so how can action be liberating action cannot destroy ignorance because action is born out of ignorance and they are hand in glove with the whole damn thing so the reason why karma is not uh, considered to be as liberating is because action emanates from ignorance because ignorance is what creates desire and desire is what motivates us to do action a simple test i have mentioned it uh, quite often as whenever i uh, talk about this i keep mentioning that if we carefully analyze our own thoughts and feelings if we spend some time in quietude in trying to understand oneself one finds a very interesting phenomenon happening every thought in some subtle form or gross form or very insidiously very innocuously very you know uh, what uh, i would call as uh, surreptitiously is linked to a desire every thought is uh, linked to desire and every desire gives rise to some kind of thought a feeling or emotion or whatever action or what to be call as a thinking process so desire and thought are very closely associated with each other so they go together thought is the origin for action isn't it thought is the origin for speech and action that's why thought word and deed so thought is always associated with desire in some form or the other the thought itself can create a deception can try to deceive itself by saying that my thought is very noble my thought is for the great welfare of the whole human kind it can imagine any kind of things it can give it can uh, give rise to ideals jiddu krishna murthy used to be very very categorical about it and say a a a, a person with ideals is a very cruel and um, uh, you know violent person he would say 
because the ideal is fictitious. The ideal is the creation of the mind, which denies the actuality. The ideal denies the fact of what is. And the ideal falsely creates a kind of hope, a kind of uh, um, anchor in order to move in a particular direction and think that, see, I am violent, I want to become non-violent. I am cruel, I want to become kind. I am uh, uh, sinful, I want to become uh, a saint or sinless. This, the, the, these ideals of non-violence or uh, saintlyhood or honesty or whatever it is, are creations or projections of the mind of what it is not. The fact of the matter is I am cruel. The fact of the matter is I am violent. I, am I able to see that truth? So this is the problem with us. So, so we have to be very, very clear. We have to come to that uh, intuitively that desire and thought are totally inseparable and thought is the one which generates or which is the root cause for all our actions. So when they are not in conflict with each other or in fact when they are closely associated with each other, how can action be liberating? How can action deny or destroy ignorance? Therefore, he says, avidyam karma na vinivartaye. The action cannot destroy ignorance. Why? Avirodhitaya. For it is not in conflict or opposed to ignorance. Action and ignorance always go together. Therefore, the only way to destroy ignorance is through self-realization, through self-knowledge, through vidya. Savidya ya vimuktaye. What do you call as vidya? Only that is called as vidya which is liberating. Everything else is avidya. The Upanishads very beautiful. They say, Dve vidya vedita vye. Paracha aparacha eva. You have to know two kinds of vidyas. One is paravidya. One is, which is transcendental. And other thing is aparavidya. Aparavidya is all mundane knowledge. Worldly knowledge. And the Upanishads are very, very categorical because they say that all the Vedas are uh, Aparavidya. All the Vedas and Vedangas, everything they classify it as all knowledge as Aparavidya. As a worldly knowledge, as mundane knowledge, even the Vedas, the uh, Rukveda, Yajurveda, Samaveda, Tharvaveda, all the Vedangas, uh, Shiksha, Vyakarana, Jyotisha, Kalpa, all these Upangas, Vedangas, or all these things are Aparavidya, it says. So they are very, very clear in their mind. The Upanishadic saints or rishis have very categorically said that all this knowledge, what is contained in the Vedas is also mundane knowledge only. Very beautifully, you see, the uh, book called Secret Doctrine, which is the magnum opus of uh, uh, Madame Blavatsky, she has written, uh, it is published in six volumes, later on condensed into three volumes, running into thousands of pages. But at the end of the secret doctrine, she says all this is not truth. Because truth cannot be put into a book. Truth is something transcendental, which is dynamic, which is ever living. How can something living be turned into dead word? So all this, even Atma Bodha, this text is Aparavidya is of no consequence from a transcendental point of view, unless we come to that tipping point. So if one thinks that through action one can get to it, it is not possible at all. What is possible is to come to that realization, to come to that self-realization, which alone can destroy ignorance, just as Light destroys darkness, the dense, deep darkness. Timira Sanghavat. Timira Sangha means uh, dense darkness. What is it that can uh, that can remove this dense darkness? Tejaha. That illumination, that brilliance, that effulgence, that light. Only that can remove 
this uh, darkness of dense ignorance. Just as Vidya, which is liberating, can remove or can destroy ignorance. So at the very beginning, the author is trying to make it very, very clear to us. Please do not depend on the idea that action is going to liberate you. Action is not going to be going to liberate you in any manner because action is bound. Any kind of action is bound by ignorance. Then should we perform action or not becomes a question. And Shankaracharya in the commentary on the Bhagavad Gita very clearly says that uh, karma is for Atma Shuddhi. Karma is only for purification. Any action which leads to purification, only such action is useful. It is only useful to come to that tipping point. It will only lead you closer and closer to that tipping point, but it will not uh, bring about that transformation. Because action is not going to bring about trans the transformation. Purity will bring about the transformation. The intensity will bring about the transformation. Action by itself cannot bring about the transformation. So that point is being made very, very clear at the beginning. So what is the kind of action we are supposed to do? We are supposed to orient all our actions towards purification. Towards exhaustion of karma. Towards not adding to the existing burden and being forced to perform actions which one does not or should not do. That is the pro that is the purpose of it. So at the very beginning, he is uh, making it clear as to the role of karma. Karma by itself cannot remove ignorance, cannot destroy ignorance. And as a derivative of that, it doesn't mean that one should not perform any action. One is bound to perform action, but that action which leads to further unburdening of oneself and leads to purification, only such action is useful. Otherwise, any other action would only put us back into this cycle of you know, birth and death in this samsara, sagara and kala chakra into this ocean of becoming and into this cycle of space and time, time and space operating in this cycle. So that's the only point. So the author wants to very, very categorically make it clear at the beginning that karma is not a liberating factor at all. It is only vidya. It is only that liberating self-knowledge or self-awakening which is going to destroy ignorance. This is the purport of the verse number three. Okay. Uh, I think uh, it's already 11.10 for you. Uh, if there are any questions, I'll stop sharing uh, the uh, content now and then uh, go to chat. If there are uh, Janakiramji, yeah, I think we discussed this in Gita, in the Bhagavad Gita classes about uh, what uh, what is action, what is uh, right action, what is wrong action, and what is inaction. Hmm? Karma, vikarma, and akarma. Uh, that is uh, very beautifully explained in the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, we need not go into it now, but primarily the idea to be understood is that uh, action which is uh, self-limiting and which is bound by ignorance is not going to really help us. It is only uh, the, uh, what do we call as a, a purificatory process through action is what is going to really help us. Yes, Janaki Ramji, you have... Uh, Anything to say? I... Action to acquire knowledge and then uh, live as per that knowledge. 
Oh yeah, action, action, acquire what knowledge, that knowledge which is going to unburden you. That is the idea behind it. Yeah, anything uh, further? Any other uh, uh, further questions, sir? If there are any further questions, we can briefly discuss them. Umesh ji. Last time uh, you raised some other question. Is it uh, relevant to our discussion today? Umesh Dhagat ji. I don't see any further uh, chat or uh, discussion. Can we uh, close the session for today? Yes, sir. Okay, any yeah. more questions? Uh, no further questions. Fine, no problem. Uh, Great. It is more, so, it is more, yeah. Yes, yes, that Indeed. means everything has been understood very well, Mr. Krishnapani. No, I, I would take it the other way around. I think uh, the participants are uh, uh, going into a deep intuitive appreciation of uh, what is being discussed rather than uh, trying to verbalize it. Yes, that's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. so right. thank you so much. Thank you thank so you much. So all right. So uh, thank, you. thank you so much, uh, Mr. Krishnabani. You really thank are you. taking bring us to take that quantum leap that you were talking about, you know, to go into in non space time causality. Okay? And uh, therefore, I really want to thank you for being this light in our lives, dispelling ignorance and helping us. Yeah, I'm so able to see Umesh ji. To... Is uh, his speaker is on? Uh, Umesh ji, yeah, please. Your your voice is not audible. Umesh ji. Umesh, would you like to say something? Yeah, he raised his now? finger. Yeah, yeah, audible can now. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. We can hear you now. Okay, so I wanted to go to the verse two that we did today, and you mm. mentioned about Atma is equal to Brahman, but mm. in not in the two aspects. Can you repeat those two aspects that it's not equal to Brahman? The 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 Atman the Atman is conditioned. Number one, the Atman is conditioned, and the Brahman is unconditioned. The Atman is uh, bound by ignorance or maya at one level and the atman per se does not operate on its own it also gets embodied so it it acquires a set of bodies as we have seen in the tattva bodha the three bodies and the five sheets and all that it it gets encased in this uh, Thing, and therefore it is it becomes jiva atman so is embodied and bound by ignorance becomes jiva or jivatma and the totally unconditioned unlimited infinite is symbolized by the term brahman but essentially they are one and the same they are one and the same so atman is a Brahman operating in limitation. That is the okay. fundamental idea to be understood. And further to that, because it is operating under limitation and uh, operating under the racing of Maya, progressively it gets uh, involved into the manifestation and comes to from uh, subtler levels to grosser levels and acquires the whole set of uh, bodies and koshas the the uh, shariras and koshas all these are acquired by the atman and uh, therefore is bound here when one is free of this 
essentially, qualitatively, it is not different from Brahman. That is the fundamental idea. Which, which in other words, the Atma Bodhan, which says that the awakened, the, mm. the Atma which is awakened, which operates mm. on the causal level, is mm. same as Brahman or is it still under the ignorance or it under the still, Maya? It is still, it is still, see, as long as it is bound, as long as there is no quantum leap into the state beyond the causal, it has to transcend all the levels. So, in other words, in other words, yeah. what you're saying is to moving from knowable to unknowable, only then it is same as Brahman. Obviously, because, see, what is known or what is knowable is possible only through the koshas and the bodies. The Brahman is unknown and unknowable. Nothing can touch it. One, one cannot uh, transcend uh, to that level through this knowledge. So it is in a state of, uh, you know, a, a timeless dimension. As, as I said, if you are stuck in this spatial temporal framework, you are stuck and you are in limitation. That is what the Atman is. Once it realizes so, that uh, this limitation is artificial and this limitation is on account of ignorance, it will take a quantum leap into the other state, which is represented by the symbol called Brahman. Mm, that's good. See, the, I the think Brahman, words, mm. the, the, the Upanishadic definition of Satyam, Jnanam, Anantam, Brahma. Mm -hmm. It is that ultimate truth. It is that ultimate uh, knowledge, if I can use the English term, which is not a correct thing. Mm -hmm. And anantam, satyam, jnanam, anantam. It is infinite. That is what is uh, given uh, the symbolic name of Brahman. Whereas mm -hmm. the other thing is stuck in this. Mm -hmm. Atman has to essentially unburden itself and break itself free of all limitations which which is going which is going into the vibration of the field of unknowable yes you are you are transcending that you are transcending this and that 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 uh, that's why the the beautiful this thing is uh, uh, quantum leap into mm. a totally different dimension altogether mm. But until then, we are still limited and conditioned, and therefore, we are not same as Brahman. Why are you worried about it now? But the, 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 please understand, please understand that you are Brahman. Why do you want to say, it, until then, I am here, until then, I am here, until they, see, you are, you are Brahman. See, you no, are perfect. I, we, you are, you are I'm assuming just... that you are imperfect because you have bound yourself. Don't feel bad about it. All of us are sailing in the same boat. We are all bound. But uh, the moment uh, you realize uh, the fact that you are Brahman, that you are unlimited, that is what is going to spur you to become unlimited, truly unlimited. unlimited. That's the reason. See, the saying that uh, Brahma with Brahma, the power of the Brahman becomes Brahman. See, there is a, I will not go into it today. Next time I will talk about it. Please remind me. There is a Brahma okay. Kita. Mm -hmm. You talk, there, there, there is a beautiful thing, analogy of uh, a Brahma, a Kita becoming a Brahma, a, a wasp uh, becoming yeah. a um, bee. Mm. So, they, they, they will come to that story. They will come to that beautiful Nyaya or uh, syllogism. Yeah. Yeah which talks about yeah. it. So we, yeah. please remind me next time, I will tell you the, the why these things are coined. They are coined for our better understanding. Yes, yes. Okay. It, it, it's good It's good to go detail into this, deep, deep into it, and not superfluously just understand the words. So I will no, no, we'll no, refer no, this no. to tomorrow. 
next time yeah next time next time we will refer to it but till that time please uh, live with the state of consciousness that i am brahman aham brahmasmi yes live with that consciousness because that is what is elevating yes if you go on thinking that i am bound i am bound i am limited i am until then i am the, like this i am going to suffer i am going to, we are going to suffer only but why don't you realize that i am essentially happy i am essentially free i am essentially brahma manobuddhi ahankara chittani naham chidananda rupa shivoham shivoham i am that pure consciousness and pure bliss i am that which is the greatest sec something which is sacred and which is most auspicious that is what is the term shiva means most auspicious and most sacred i am that that is what is to be born in mind and that will be liberating okay sir thank you so much thank you very much box, krishna pani yes sir thank you see the chat box yeah i am just seeing that uh, every attainment against odds is due to we are brahman in essence absolutely right janaki ram ji is correct every attainment against all odds in life is because we are essentially brahman if we bear that in mind if we hold on to that that is what is going to be liberating we are essentially brahman yes sir so uh, let us uh, continue to uh, live in that uh, state of uh, uh, consciousness that uh, i am that brahman okay sir thank you very much sajni ji thank you again uh, you can close it any more questions if not close yeah we can close i think uh, thank you very much mr krishna pani for being with us every week and being our guiding light on the spiritual journey And I will now end. Thank you so much. Yes, all over the globe. Look. Thank you. Thank you. I'm forward to seeing you. Another program is on Friday. We will be covered by Vijay. We have two programming meetings on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. Kindly, kindly.